Welcome back. This is uh, lecture six of Economics for Everyone. It's been two weeks now since we last saw each other, so I want to give you a special welcome back. Uh, welcome Mary Beth and Robert and Vikram, George, Manju, welcome. Antoinette and Donna, Vince, Santa and Sam, welcome everybody. I'm so pleased actually to have this chance to interact with you uh, online. In some sense, you know, reflecting upon this, it's sort of going to underscore the importance of the principles that we've been using to govern the class up uh, until now. Um, this is a great opportunity for you to exercise responsibility over uh, your learning and for me to step up my game as a, a coach, as a support person who makes available the resources uh, so that you can achieve uh, your own goals for this course. That said, um, the situation has changed dramatically in our, all our lives, and uh, certainly the city of New York is not the same city it was just two weeks ago. And I understand your own personal lives and your work lives and um, other parts of your lives uh, may be quite dynamic, and I appreciate the emails people have sent me to um, to outline uh, some of the challenges that they face. So I want you to know uh, I'm with you in some small way uh, in this. Um, what's important in this course is that you improve your knowledge of economics. And you do it relative to where you started off in the course. What I want to see is not that everyone becomes an expert economist, but everyone having in the context of um, applied themselves sincerely improved their understanding of the subject. So let's look at success in terms of changes <laughs> on the margin, uh, 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 if, if you will. I want you to do the best you possibly can under the circumstances you are facing and obviously those circumstances are more challenging now than they were just two or three uh, weeks ago. So I do appreciate you keeping me in touch if your situation changes and if there's anything I can do to support you, uh, please let me know by email. I know in that email that I sent you a couple of weeks ago outlining the next direction for the course I suggested that you could uh, telephone me and I'd hold a, a type of office hour over te telephone. Obviously that's no longer possible because the university is shut down. So I invite you to use email and we can set up uh, meetings in, um, in different media uh, as, as appropriate. Okay, so um, full steam ahead. And what I'd like to do is pick up the conversation that we had last day and begin applying um, uh, demand and supply curves in perfectly competitive um, markets. Um, so just to repeat a little bit from last our last conversation, what we're doing here is engaging in a theory of value. What determines the rate at which one good exchanges for another? Okay. And that rate we call uh, a price. And prices in this neoclassical theory of value are always relative. It's always in comparison to. There are no absolutes. And as we discussed, prices are determined in the market. And the market brings buyers and sellers together to determine how much is exchanged and at what price it's exchanged. I've pointed out, and as you intuitively are aware, <laughs> um, buyers and sellers have conflicting interests. And so we understand markets working in the context of a bargaining process. Uh, and we're going to explore that uh, more analytically with demand and supply curves. But also we're going to go a little bit further. Um, in a perfectly competitive market, no individual buyer or seller has power over the market price and yet if they can somehow collectively recognize their interests they can manipulate the market and they can use agents like the government 
uh, to help them change market outcomes for the benefit of some and possibly for the de detriment of uh, others. And so hopefully by the end of this lecture, we'll have the infrastructure in place to not only understand how perfectly competitive markets uh, work, but also how they can, uh, how the market outcome can be changed or, or manipulated. And again, we're talking about perfectly competitive markets. We discuss the conditions under which those markets are defined, a large number of buyers and sellers of a perfectly homogeneous commodity in the context of full, complete information. Okay. And actually, uh, your textbook has a lovely video. Uh, it's a case study where they interviewed, the authors of the book interviewed an economist who studied the Fulton fish market. And um, that is a market that on the face of it looks pretty close to be perfectly competitive. It operated, I think, until it moved recently in the, um, the Lower East Side. And in a perfectly competitive market, we expect to see all market transactions occur at uh, the same price. And the economist was able to discern that different buyers, Asian buyers versus Caucasian buyers were charged different prices. And uh, I think she offered some very um, compelling evidence of that, but also an appreciation that we should all share of the importance of this model, that if it, even if in the extreme it isn't always applicable or always perfectly holding, it's a good template to start an analysis of a situation. And I think Robert put this well in one of the previous lectures when he was summarizing Harford on this. It's our lens onto the world. Um, it's not the paintbrush or the paints that we use to paint the world. Um, so we're not believers in markets, we use them as an analytical tool, as a starting point, um, and we understand deviations from perfectly competitive uh, outcomes as best as we can, because in some sense, the perfectly competitive market leads uh, to a socially desirable uh, outcome of what we call Pareto efficiency. So we're going to apply this understanding of markets, uh, perfectly, of the perfectly competitive market and the analytical tools, demand and supply curves that are appropriate for them to understanding other commodity markets, not just the fish market as in that video, but also, uh, as I suggested, public policy directed to producers in, in these markets. And this is going to set up uh, an understanding for market failure. Now, as we suggested last day, um, there are two fundamental theorem of theorems of welfare economics, that a perfectly competitive market leads to an efficient outcome, um, and secondly, that we can attain any efficient outcome with an appropriate lump sum redistribution of initial property rights. So there might be a market outcome, it might be efficient in the Pareto sense, in the sense that you can't make somebody better off without making somebody else worse off. So that's efficiency not just in production, not efficiency not just in an engineering sense, making the best possible use of the resources available to you to produce as much as possible, but also efficiency in exchange so that those resources are being allocated to the people who value them most. Okay? So we might not feel that a, particularly, a particular efficient outcome is fair or just or best in some sort of normative sense. And so the second welfare theorem uh, suggests that we might rationalize government intervention out of this sense of fairness or justice if we can somehow design um, policies that uh, don't disrupt um, or create disincentives um, that lead to inefficiency, and that's what lump sum transfers are, are, are imagined to do. 
that's certainly one rationale for government intervention. But we're going to pause on that and set up um, or examine situations in which the market calculus, calculus that leads to individually efficient results may not be socially efficient. Okay? And this is captured in, in words like externalities or public goods and other types of inefficiencies inherent in the operation of uh, the market. And this too is a rationale for public policy uh, for intervention. Okay. So that theme, theme three on this slide, is going to be the discussion of the next and final lecture in this block. But if we're going to focus on the neoclassical theory of value, our touchstone is uh, another famous economist that I want to introduce you to, Alfred Marshall. And Alfred Marshall taught at Cambridge University in Britain in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And uh, just as we take from uh, Ricardo and Malthus the notion of marginal reasoning, um, notions of rent and scarcity and of comparative advantage, and just as we take from Adam Smith um, the idea of um, the division of labor and the productivity associated with the division of labor, so from Marshall we take some great uh, concepts and ideas. And Marshall was an architect, one of the architects of the neoclassical theory of value that said that values in the marketplace were determined by demand and supply. And so he has this great quote, and I take it from the eighth edition of his famous textbook, a textbook that generations of economists were exposed to between the 1890s and, and um, well into the 1920s and, and 30s. And Marshall says, we might as reasonably dispute whether it is the upper or the under blade of a pair of scissors that cuts a piece of paper, as whether value is governed by utility or cost of production. So here he's trolling the classical theorists uh, Marx, Ricardo, uh, Smith, and others who felt that value came from the production side of the economy. Okay? But he's also trolling um, other theorists, particularly uh, William Stanley Jevons, who wrote in the 1800s that it all came from utility, from the satisfaction that people get, that value came from the demand side of the market. And from Marshall, we learn that it's simultaneously demand and supply that determine relative prices. And this is a good example of how economists think. Now, perhaps a little bit, perhaps distinguishing economists from other social uh, scientists in, in, in some way. We think in terms of simultaneity, in terms of interactions. Okay. Uh, and if you wanted to express this mathematically, it would be a simultaneous equations uh, model where many forces come together to determine particular uh, 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 variables. But demand and supply are two relationships that determine two outcomes, price and quantity. And they do it uh, jointly. So that's all very good. But if we want to start using these tools, we want to begin to characterize demand and supply curves. And that's what we'll uh, do in this lecture. And as I suggested last day, we're going to run this through a couple of motivating examples, two goods that are complements. Coffee and milk come together to produce if there's sufficient division of labor and fancy enough machines. <laughs> uh, um, uh, a cappuccino. Okay, and so we're interested in the price of coffee and we're interested in the price of milk. And we saw last day that the price of coffee is very variable 
over the short term, rising significantly in some years and falling just as rapidly in a short period of time. We also saw that it trends downward. So in this picture, of course, I want you to focus on the red line, which are the real prices, or the inflation-adjusted prices. It's a bit ironic that economists call these real prices because we don't actually observe them in reality. We have to do a calculation to correct for changes in the purchasing power of money over time. So whenever we're comparing prices over time, we want to be sure that we're holding the um, purchasing power of money constant. And all these uh, prices, as I suggested last time, are, I'm sorry, the, all the um, prices in the red line uh, are in uh, 2002 US dollars. The gray line are the prices we actually uh, observe in the market in those particular years. The other thing that's notable about the coffee price is the downward trend. So producers in this market face a less than desirable situation. The price they receive for the product they sell uh, can fluctuate a lot in the short term. That must engender insecurity. And it's trending downward, suggesting that their living standards are potentially falling over time. The price of milk varies in a very different uh, way. So here, prices um, are expressed along the um, vertical axis relative to the price that prevailed in 2002. That's why the dashed line is drawn at 1. So you can imagine this as $1. Whatever quantity of milk that you could buy for $1 in uh, 2002 is the base case here. That uh, quantity of milk cost a dollar in 2002, um, but uh, a decade or more later, it's costing a dollar twenty or a dollar uh, forty. And a decade or two earlier, it was costing sixty cents to eighty cents. The red line is the monthly information for the United States. The gray line, the monthly information for Canada. Again, all based upon um, uh, 2002. And even between countries, we notice some differences. Uh, milk is certainly less variable than coffee, and it trends upward. And it seems to be trending differently across the countries. After about 2005 or 2006, the U.S. series becomes more variable and uh, seems to stop trending. So what's that all about? The other thing I notice when I look closely at these monthly prices is that the Canadian data sometimes take these discrete steps. Why would that be? So hopefully we'll have everything in place by the end of this lecture to offer an explanation. And that's an explanation I think I'm going to leave as an exercise for you uh, uh, last day. And you're going to use your answers to the very last question in the assignment, uh, question five, to help figure this out. But let's start with our need to characterize uh, demand and supply curves. And that characterization in part, in large part, is captured with this word elasticity. Now at a general level, elasticity refers to the relationship between a dependent variable and an independent variable. If we're talking about the demand curve, then from the consumer's perspective, price is the independent variable. It's the causal variable. It's the mover. It's the variable that the consumer has uh, no control over, and it's the variable that pushes the consumer. And the quantity demanded is the dependent variable. It's the outcome. It's the result. It's the behavioral change in the consumer that is induced by the change in price. But elasticity is a general concept between any two 
uh, dependent or independent variables, not just price and quantity. You might think of this term as referring to responsiveness. How responsive is the quantity demanded to the price that the consumer faces? Okay. Uh, so elasticity can be a bit confusing, but a synonym is responsiveness. But uh, elasticity, uh, in the way we're going to use it, carries a more specific meaning. It has an analytical meaning. And this term comes from um, Marshall. And I've taken uh, this quote from the opening paragraph in one of the chapters of his textbook. He says, We have seen that the only universal law as to a person's desire for a commodity is that it diminishes other things being equal with every increase in his supply of that commodity. Now I have to admit to you uh, his use of the masculine pronoun uh, greets to my ear as it probably does to yours and in my own writing I, I, I avoid this whole issue of gender by using third person plural. Um, I speak of they or their rather than he or she uh, as much as I, I can. Um, but Marshall was writing more than a hundred years ago and society was uh, very different and it's actually interesting to read some parts of his book. You can only imagine what dinnertime conversation was like in Victorian England um, at that time. Um, so there's a lot of baggage there but uh, we'll put that aside. What he's saying in that first sentence is that the utility that people receive from consuming things increases with consumption, but at a decreasing rate. Okay, so we have this endless variety of desires or wants, um, but for every desire or want we have, to each of them, there's, um, there's a limit. Uh, there's a sati satiation uh, point. And the increase in our satisfaction um, diminishes as we consume more and more of a commodity and approach that satiation point. Diminishing marginal utility. Okay? But this diminution may be slow or rapid. Okay? So we haven't said anything yet about how fast the marginal utility falls or how slowly it falls. If it falls slowly, if it is slow, the price that he will give for the commodity will not fall much in consequence of a considerable increase in his supply of it. Okay? I, as a consumer, is, am always comparing my subjective valuation of an additional unit of consumption to the valuation that the market offers, to the price that I observe. And if my valuation is greater than the market price, then it makes sense for me to consume more of that commodity. Okay? Recall um, the walks I took in the early lectures of this course to find my uh, cappuccino. Okay? If it is low, the price that he will give for the commodity will not fall much in consequence of a consider considerable increase in his supply of it. And a small fall in price will cause a comparatively large increase in his purchases. So I don't need m much of a fall in price to induce me to buy an extra unit if my marginal utility is tapering off very slowly. But if it tapers off quickly, but if it is rapid, a small fall in price will cause only a very small increase in his purchases. Okay? My subjective valuation is falling off very fast, and it's very likely that it will fall below the prevailing market price. At that point, I stop consumption. In the former case, his willingness to purchase the thing stretches itself out a great deal under the action of a small inducement. 
the elasticity of his wants, we may say, is great. Okay? It's, it's my marginal utility that's getting stretched out. All right? It's falling off at a very slow rate. In the latter case, the extra inducement given by the fall in price causes hardly any extension of his desire to purchase. The elasticity of his demand is small. And so it's to Marshall and Marshall's legacy that this odd word elasticity is part of the vocabulary that we use as economists. Now, to get more analytical, we also use that term in a very specific way. An elasticity is the percentage change in the dependent variable for a given percentage change in the independent variable. Okay? We can uh, alternatively just think of relative difference. The relative difference in quantity divided by the relative difference in price. And the reason we focus on percentage or relative uh, changes is because our me measure of responsiveness, our characterization of uh, the demand or the supply curve, is not going to be influenced by the units we, uh, uh, we use uh, to measure uh, quantity demanded or supplied. So for example, here is our hypothetical uh, demand curve. Uh, price in the uh, vertical direction and uh, quantity in the horizontal uh, direction. And our law of demand, which comes from the law of diminishing marginal utility, suggests that in this space the demand curve will be downward sloping. You might think that the slope is a measure of uh, responsiveness. So the slope of the curve is how much quantity changes for a given change in, uh, in price. But the slope of the demand curve is going to depend upon how I measure these quantities. In this picture I'm measuring them in the actual number of whatever these items are, but I could just as easily measure them in the dozens of items. If I did that, the same demand curve would look much steeper, okay? or I could measure it in the thousands. So changing that unit of measure is going to change the, uh, the slope, and so we don't have a unitless measure of uh, responsiveness. And in the extreme, if I extend this uh, demand curve out to touch the uh, the um, two axes, all right, the slope stays the same throughout this curve, but the elasticity, the percentage change in quantity for a percentage change in price, changes along the curve. A quick uh, rule of thumb is that the elasticity is the ratio of the length of this part of the segment. Let's say we're talking at point P, take this length of the demand curve and divide it by this length, and that will give you the elasticity. So when prices are very high, the elasticity is very great. On the other hand, when prices are very low and quantity demanded almost reach the, reaches the satiation point, the elasticity approaches zero, and in the extreme, at this point is, 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 is zero. Okay? So when prices are high, you, can, you tend to see a very high uh, elasticity. A small decrease in price brings more consumers in, in, into the market. Not a lot was being consumed to begin with, and any increase in percentage terms is quite significant. Now, I don't want you to give you, give you the suggestion, I don't want to give you the um, suggestion that all demand curves are linear like this. It's just a, there are relationships and we need to uncover relationships and uh, we can often imagine them being curved or having different uh, shapes. We're just going to use linearity as a functional form uh, that's uh, uh, simple. And so here is the notation for slope. It's the change in the um, 
the uh, dependent variable over the change in the independent variable. There's a bit of a, a quirk, and I'll let you read this uh, footnote, that's also part of Marshall's legacy. Generally in mathematics, we put the independent variable on the horizontal axis, which is also called the x-axis, axis, and the, um, the uh, dependent variable on the vertical uh, axis, or the y-axis. Uh, Marshall flipped that down around and economics in the um, British tradition, although not in the continental European tradition, uh, just follows that quirk. Uh, but here is the formula for elasticity. It's the change in quantity divided by the initial quantity, the change in price divided by the initial price. That's the relative change in quantity. That's the relative change in price. We can multiply these things by 100, both top and bottom, to get the percentage changes, but when we do that division, the 100 just cancels uh, out. So it's just as simple to stick um, uh, with this. Now, you might have a concern here about you know which quantity and which price you can use. We could use the initial quantity and initial price. We could use the, the final quantity, the final price, or, or we could use some average uh, between them. Um, but for our purposes, let's just fix ideas and use the initial price and quantity when we make our calculations. So let's do question one of the assignment. And thank you for all those uh, of you, who, and the broad majority did, uh, submitted their assignments to me. That was very helpful because it allowed me to sort of see where you're going, where the, um, uh, where the pitfalls and where the curves in the road are. So again, do the best you can and, and uh, try to um, meet the uh, uh, course uh, deadlines. It's um, not that I want to judge you, it's that I use this information to help me communicate with you. So wherever you're at, just submit what you've got. And if you're not able to make the deadline, just send me a short note and, and uh, give me a, a, an explanation. That's all very good. What are the factors that determine the price elasticity of demand? What are the factors that determine the price elasticity of supply? So your textbook has a conversation about this. Um, let me sort of give you a categorization that I use. There are a number of factors that determine the price elasticity of demand. The first is sort of a, uh, an analytical requirement, the degree of commodity classification. And so this will depend upon the purpose of our analysis. The more finely defined the commodity, the higher the elasticity. Okay, and um, and and it's and, and how we, as I suggested, how we classify commodities depends what we want to look at. So, as an example, the price elasticity of a particular type of coffee bean that elasticity is going to be higher than if I, if I was looking at all coffee beans. <laughs> Obviously, if the price of Brazilian coffee beans changes, uh, people can move to uh, other types of, of beans. But if I'm looking at coffee beans, there are less substitutes for that. Okay? Similarly, the price elasticity of coffee beans is going to be higher than if the subject of my analysis was caffeinated beverage product, products. And that price elasticity is going to be higher still than if the analysis is focused on beverage products, and so forth. Okay, you can make up your own examples. Uh, I, uh, you can talk about peas versus vegetables, for example. Whatever. The other important thing is the nature of the uh, commodity. If a commodity has no close substitutes, its price elasticity uh, of demand will be low. And so for the necessities of life, um, you're going to see a relatively inelastic demand, little price responsiveness. And in the um, post on my website that introduces this lecture, I, uh, I included a, a short clip of AOC uh, talking about elasticity in the Senate, which is, I guess, always rewarding to see. She was actually an economics student, uh, and she talked about uh, healthcare. So if you haven't looked at that, uh, go ahead and, and do it. 
but necessities tend to have uh, a low elasticities. If we're focusing on um, uh, rather well-to-do people, uh, um, they might have some luxury goods, and if those luxury goods don't take up a big proportion of their budget, they also tend to be relatively inelastic. And that's why the market sometimes gets segmented and um, charges the, that group of individuals rather high prices, say for a good bottle of, 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 of wine. Their demand won't vary very much, uh, uh, regardless of the price, uh, uh, as long as they have very um, significant incomes. And so this also speaks to the uh, third determinant elasticity, the portion of the consumer's budget accounted for by the commodity. If a commodity represents a real large fraction of the share of an individual's uh, uh, income or a household's income, then price fluctuations will actually change the standard of living, the accessible income uh, of that household, and that will have another knock-on effect, either increasing or decreasing elasticity. These are called uh, income effects in, in, in the literature, and we won't, you'll get to that in another course in economics if you want to take it. Finally, a crucial one is the length of time of the analysis. The longer the time period to adjust to price differences, the larger the elasticity. Okay? So time is needed for consumers to change their habits or to get information about uh, alternatives, uh, but also to make any necessary physical changes um, that uh, would facilitate uh, consumption. So you can sort of think about uh, the price of uh, gas or oil being relatively inelastic in the short run, but rather more elastic in the longer run as consumption habits change, as people change their residential patterns to be closer to work, or as people buy uh, more efficient vehicles or switch to bicycling, uh, things of that sort. So time is really a uh, crucial uh, determine of the elasticity of demand. Oops. Uh, similarly, for supply, uh, short periods of time imply a small elasticity. In the limit, supply might be limited to the existed, uh, existing stocks in the good or the current rate of production. Last day, we talked about uh, why it might be reasonable to expect, uh, reasonable in an economic sense, uh, to expect a, a spike in the price of hand sanitizers if the demand automatically goes up. Um, but I was suggesting that could just be a very short-term response because if you look at things in, in a daily or weekly sense, um, it's the quantity available, the stock available uh, in that period um, uh, that is driving supply. But with a little bit more time, uh, uh, shipments can come in, uh, production facilities can be wrapped up, and supply will increase. Perishable commodities will be inelastic over short periods of times, um, but economy, economies, uh, products that can be uh, stored will be relatively more inelastic and they'll be sort of um, held back um, to build up stocks if there's an expectation of future uh, price increases or put on the market depending upon uh, how price moves. Um, but time is really important on the supply side as well. Uh, uh, with a given set of production facilities, some time is needed to uh, ramp up uh, production. Um, and economists on the supply side make a distinction between short period and long period. And sometimes it's called short run or long run. And the distinction between them is when you can change uh, the capital stock. When investment can be made and bring um, more capital to bear in producing uh, the product. When not just the change in the use of a plant can be varied, but also the number of plants or facilities to produce the product it can change. And so we also speak of short period supply curves or long period supply curves. And this is why I suggested last day, though there may be a um, 
a law of demand. There is no law of supply um, because in the long run, um, depending upon the technology of production, the long run supply curve, uh, if there are important economies of scale, could actually be downward uh, um, sloping. So um, let's uh, pursue uh, this knowledge with some examples drawn from the, uh, the assignment. In question two, you're asked to make that elasticity calculation, but with a little bit of a twist. You're told that the price of the com a commodity falls from $20 to $19. That's good. You've already been given the information you need for the bottom part of the elasticity calculation. Price fell one, from $1 and it was initially $20. But the trick is you're not given any information about uh, quantities. Total expenditure per week increased from $200,000 to $228,000. Is the demand for this commodity elastic or inelastic? and calculate the price elasticity of demand. Let's start with the first question. We speak of um, a, a price, um, uh, a demand curve being elastic or price inelastic depending upon the impact of a change in price on total expenditures. And the dividing line between elastic and inelastic is unit elasticity. When the price elasticity of demand is equal to 1, that's the same thing as saying that the percentage change in quantity is the same as the percentage change in price. So when price um, falls, for example, what do you expect to happen to total expenditures on the good. Well, if the quantity purchased stayed the same and now the price is lower, expenditures must fall. But the law of demand tells us quantity won't stay the same, it will increase. And when we have unit elasticity, that increase is proportionately the same as the decrease in price and fully compensates the um, the uh, 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 fully compensates for the change in the fall in price so that expenditures uh, um, stay the same. You might lose 10% in expenditures because of the fall in price, but you gain 10% in expenditures because of the increase in quantity. Okay? If the elasticity is less than one, um, then the implication is that the change in quantity is lower, proportionately speaking, than the change in price. So it doesn't fully compensate. The increase in quantity doesn't fully compensate um, for the decrease in price, and total expenditures fall. You get a hit in expenditures because of the fall in price. You get an increase because of the increase in quantity, but the increase in quantity is not so much. And the opposite happens when the elasticity is greater than 1. Here, quantity is relatively more responsive. A given percentage change in price causes a more, uh, 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 more than that percentage increase in quantity. So as a result, price fell, but quantity increased proportionately more, and total expenditures increase. So we know that in this example, the fall in price led to an increase in expenditures. So we must, it must be the case that the demand curve is, quote, elastic uh, in this range of prices. Oh, um, so yes, here is a slide that explains what I was trying to say. And this has a personal note for me because I really admire uh, Trader Joe's. <laughs> I find the prices reasonable, but darn, I've noticed that um, my grocery bills have gone up. 
Uh, and I think, and there's a marketing dimension to this too, but I think it's because um, my expenditures are price elastic. I end up buying more than I otherwise would because I find these prices more reasonable than at other stores or what, I'm, what, what I was accustomed to before. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, let's do the calculation. As I said, we know the bottom part. Price fell from 20 to 19, so that's a difference of 1. Divided by the initial price, that's 20, so 1 20th. But we have to calculate uh, the quantity from the um, information on expenditures. So expenditures equal to price uh, times quantity. And so quantity is expenditures divided by price. The initial quantity is 200,000 divided by 20, or 10,000 units. Do the same thing for the final quantity, 228,000 divided by 19 is 12,000 units. And so now we have all the elements that we need. The change in uh, quantity is minus 2,000 divided by the initial quantity, 10,000. All of that divided by 1 over 20 gives you, eventually when you do the calculations, an elasticity of 4. So this is a very elastic demand. All right? And you see this is a unitless number. So it's um, uh, the, the, um, the slope of the curve comes into play, um, but because everything is being measured in proportional terms, uh, we have this pure uh, number. So uh, an elasticity of four means that if prices change by 1%, quantities will change by 4% in the opposite direction. A 10 percentage, 10 percentage point increase in price would lead to a 40% a decrease in quantity. Now there are other important elasticities that we should be aware of, and you know when Mar uh, when Marshall talks about demand and supply together determining price in any one market, um, that's the case in all sorts of markets, and markets are interrelated, and and they're interrelated through some of the um, determinants uh, of uh, demand schedules particularly the prices of other goods and, and, uh, uh, and incomes. So it's an important to understand cross-price cross elasticities and income elasticities of demand. The dependent variable is the quantity demanded, but the independent variable uh, we're going to change to the price of another uh, good, another related good, when we spek of cross-price uh, cross elasticities. And these are used to characterize the relationship between the prices of other goods and the quantity demanded of particular goods. So we're accustomed to the idea of substitutes. So analytically, a substitute is um, a relationship in which the cross-price elasticity is positive. If the price of another good goes up and it is a substitute for this good, the demand for the good we're interested in will go up. All right. For complements, the opposite will happen, a negative price elasticity. So when we do our studies and we look for these cross relationships, the, the, the sign as well as the magnitude is very important for them. Complements are goods that go together. Um, and so oh, I, it's a terrible uh, 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 typo here. This should be, are said to be a complements if in the increase of uh, price in one good leads to a decrease in the demand for the other. So if the price of milk goes up, you might suspect that my demand for coffee would fall. Okay? And tea and coffee are um, because these goods are, are, are complements. Tea and coffee, on the other hand, are, are substitutes. Income elasticities are used to characterize the relationship between income and the quantity demanded of a particular good. So quantity demanded is the dependent variable, and the independent or causal variable now is income. 
we speak of inferior goods when the income elasticity of demand is negative. That's to say, a certain percentage increase in the consumer's income leads to a decrease in the demand for this good. That's an inferior good. Normal goods have a positive income elasticity of demand. And there's two types of normal goods. Um, a, um, 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 a luxury is a good with an income elasticity that's greater than one, so a proportionately larger increase in the demand for the good for a given increase in income, and a necessary good is positive but less than one. So this is just to illustrate the, the use of elasticity in other contexts, but to underscore the fact that markets are interrelated. So the kind of analysis we're doing is called partial equilibrium analysis. We are looking at one market in isolation. But if markets are connected and we change one market, we could reasonably, through um, 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 uh, these cross-price effects, and possibly income effects influence demand in other markets. So for example, the textbook cites the case of uh, cotton production uh, during the Civil War in the United States when President uh, Lincoln embargoed exports of cotton from the southern states uh, to Great Britain and other parts of Europe. And the textbook discusses the ripple effects that this had in the global cotton trade, influencing suppliers in Latin America, um, in Egypt, and in India, um, changing production facilities in Great Britain to be able to make use of slightly different cotton in India. And this amazing interaction is all mediated by markets uh, without anyone having a plan for them, everyone responding to these price signals. So and that would be called a, a general equilibrium uh, analysis. Well, let's continue with the assignment. So we're getting closer to answering one of the motivating uh, questions in um, this block. Question three says, per capita coffee consumption during the first three, first three months of a year uh, dropped to three pounds from 3.6 pounds. And the price of coffee, coffee over that period rose by 81%. Okay, So to calculate the price elasticity of demand, we have the bottom part of our formula given to us, 81%. Uh, and here's the calculation. Um, demand went from uh, 3 to 3.6. And in the end, and, and divided by the initial um, amount, 3, um, we end up with an elasticity of 0.25. This is an inelastic demand. It's less than one. What do you expect, what do you think happened to total expenditures on this good when the price went up? Well, quantity fell, so you'd think total expenditures would fall, but they didn't fall proportionally as much as price rose. This good is inelastic, so even though price going up and quantity falling, um, expenditures go up. Why might this not be a good estimate of the price elasticity of demand for coffee? Well, go back to that earlier conversation that we had about the uh, determinants of elasticity. And the first thing that I think about is the time frame. It's only three months. And this might not be long enough to allow consumers to fully uh, change their habits. And if this is expected to be a permanent increase in price, and as time goes on, some people will drop out of the market, 
and others will adjust their um, their habits. They will possibly consume even less coffee, or they might switch to uh, other um, uh, uh, substitutes. So we would expect over the longer term for that elasticity to be greater. Now, let's use our demand and supply curves to explain why the price of coffee tends to be so variable rising sharply and falling just as sharply within short periods of time. And then also to explain uh, why it's trended downwards. All right, so we're going to explain something. We're going to use a model to do it. And given our understanding of the coffee market, given our understanding of the um, nature of demand and the nature of supply in that market, we can reasonably suspect that both consumer demand and producer supply is going to be relatively inelastic. Okay? Consumers have this habit to this quasi-addictive commodity, and um, supply is produced sort of in annual cycles. It certainly takes time to bring more production uh, facilities uh, to this market, New coffee plants have to be planted. Uh, the seedlings have to be nurtured, and they have to mature before you increase productive capacity. So in the short run, we would expect supply to be relatively inelastic. So if any sort of uh, shock, let's say a shock on the supply side hits this market, some exogenous variable changes, most of the adjustment to that is going to happen in terms of prices, not in terms of quantities. Let me illustrate what I mean. So here is our hypothetical uh, coffee market, and I've drawn the curves relatively steeply to reflect my intuition that both demand and supply are inelastic uh, over a horizon, even uh, measured in months or even over a, 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 a year. And Let's say something happens on the supply side. There's um, bad weather in Brazil. There is a freeze, and some of the uh, coffee plants are, are destroyed. Well, that means um, the supply curve shifts back. There's a bunch of exogenous variables associated with the amount of production facilities, um, with the productivity, uh, and with the uh, factor uh, prices that fix the supply curve. So all of a sudden, um, acreage is taken out of the market, supply shifts back. At the initial equilibrium price, we have a capacity at that price to produce this much, but we have a greater demand. This is a situation of excess demand. The excess demand tilts the bargaining power to the producers, and prices get bid up. All right. You can see, though, that there have been adjustments both in price and in quantity. But the change in quantity has been relatively small because demand is so inelastic. Okay. So it's price that takes the burden of that adjustment and drives us to the new equilibrium. Total expenditures in the initial equilibrium were P star times Q star. Okay. Q star times P star, the area of that box represents total expenditures. Price times quantity is total expenditures. In the new equilibrium, there's a new Q. It's slightly less than the OQ, suggesting expenditures fall. That's what's going on here. But the higher P leads to a huge addition to expenditures. Total expenditures are given by the area of this rectangle, and that is higher than this rectangle because demand is inelastic. Okay? So the huge variation that we see in the coffee market has to do with relative inelasticities in demand and supply. There could be shocks on the demand side as well, 
but supply is sort of easier to talk about or to manage, imagine in this case. What about the trend? Well, our suspicion is that the increase in production capacities in supply over time has been occurring faster than the growth in, uh, growth in demand. Demand growth probably reflects population growth. Remember, there's a diminishing marginal utility to the extra coffee consumption, and in Marshall's terms, that diminishing marginal utility falls off relatively rapidly. <laughs> uh, I can only drink so many cups of coffee uh, a day. Uh, that's basically uh, my, my demand. Uh, so you're not going to get more consumption from each person, but as the population increases, you could get more demand for this thing. The point is, though, that production facilities are probably shifting out faster than demand is shifting out, and that is what's causing the slow downward trend in coffee prices. Okay? And then that downward trend is probably what's led or offered an incentive uh, for some entrepreneurs to come into the North American market and try to make it more monopolistically competitive, um, increasing value-added, differentiating products, making consumption um, uh, more branded. So there might be a higher end to some types of coffees and a lower end to other co coffees, working on making coffee sold in many, many locations, so it's easier to consume, doing all these things to uh, push back against that. All right. So our large part of our explanation has to do with understanding the shifts in demand and supply and the shapes in these curves. And that's what I meant early on about the characterization of the curves. Let's take another example, one that's, uh, I think, appropriate for public policy. Uh, the incidence of a specific tax. A specific tax is just a given tax on, um, on a commodity, regardless of how much is sold. It's to be distinguished from what's called an ad valerum tax, or a value-added tax, which is based upon the uh, value of uh, how much is sold. So the tax you're accustomed to paying for your restaurant meals in New York is an ad valerum tax. It's some percentage of your total bill as opposed to a fixed amount of the bill. We'll just make things simple and imagine a fixed amount um, being added to your bill for a quantity and call that T. So we want to explain the impact of this tax on the equilibrium pricing quantity. Uh, we want to explain the difference between the legal and the economic incidence of the tax. And we want to play around with the curves to illustrate how that equilibrium price and quantity could vary according to different structures of demand and supply. Let me off the bat define the legal incidence of the tax. The legal incidence refers to the obligation to remit the tax to the government. Is it the consumer or is it the producer that is obliged to send those tax payments to the government. That's the legal incidence. And that's to be distinguished from the economic incidence, which we can only know when we decide what the final equilibrium price is. Will the final equilibrium price go up by the extent of the tax? Or will it not go up at all? Or will it go up somewhere in between? And that will determine who actually ends up paying the tax. So here's our market. It's in equilibrium, and we're going to engage in an exercise that we call comparative statics. We're going to compare this initial equilibrium to a new equilibrium where something has quote-unquote changed, but nothing else in the world has changed. And then we're going to compare the equilibria to see what's happened in the market. A specific tax refers to a supply curve that's moved up because this is affecting the, um, the costs of the producer. Whereas the producers were willing to produce quantity Q at price P beforehand, they're not 
going to be able to do that now that the tax is imposed because they have an extra cost to face. And that cost is given by P plus T. So the supply curve at that point shifts up to here. If it does that at this point, then it does it at all points on the supply curve. Join all those new points and you have the new supply curve. So the difference here, P to P plus T, is the amount of the tax. We do this on the supply side because the legal incidence of the tax was placed on suppliers. Okay, that's fine. And if that's the new supply curve and that's the initial price, you can see again that we have excess demand at that price and the market will reach a new equilibrium given by this dot. So what we have to do here is compare the old equilibrium, P star, Q star, to the new equilibrium, Q and the new price, P plus T. So look at the new equilibrium. The price has gone up. It's risen from P star to P plus T, but it has not gone up by the full extent of the tax. This difference is less than the tax. So consumers are paying more, all right? But producers aren't being fully compensated for the tax that they have to remit to the government. And this tells you how the tax is being shared. This distance does. Producers are paying this much of the tax. Consumers are paying this much of the tax. And the way I've drawn the picture, they are roughly each paying half the tax. All right? So that's the economic incidence. You can only derive it once you know the new equilibrium and make a comparison to the old equilibrium. We sort of had uh, an example of this recently in New York. I heard this collective snicker from economists when it was announced that the commission that um, New Yorkers pay to brokers in order to find an apartment okay, would be eliminated. All right? You don't, apparently, I don't know if this policy has actually gone through, maybe actually Vince, you probably know better than I do, uh, but for economists, mm, this doesn't look like a gift horse to consumers. It all depends upon what happens to rents in the end. It may be that rents go up by the full extent of the commission and consumers in the end still end up paying uh, the commission in a, in, a, in a sense. That will happen, the sharing, the economic incidence, um, the sharing of the tax between consumers and producers will be determined by the relative elasticities of the demand and supply curves. And that's what the other part of the question asks us to explore. Here's the case in which demand is perfectly inelastic. In this case, the economic and the legal incidence of the tax are the same. Producers are able to fully pass on the tax to consumers in a higher price. You might reasonably argue that the kind of demand for apartments in, in New York and in Manhattan is relatively uh, inelastic at some point. And so maybe the suggestion that those commissions aren't going to be charged by the broker anymore well, could well lead to uh, uh, prices in that market going up and consumers still getting, uh, um, having to pay indirectly that commission. But when Demand is relatively more inelastic than supply. A greater share of the economic incidence of, the, of this tax falls on the consumer. In this extreme case, it falls entirely on the consumer because they can't escape. And maybe this is what AOC is talking about when she refers to healthcare not having an elasticity. Um, in that video that I've linked to on, on my site. There's no capacity for consumers to substitute away from this commodity. 
and they could be charged anything for it if it's in the private sector. Here's the opposite case um, where demand is perfectly elastic. So this is an elast price elasticity of infinity. Now consumers can relative, uh, relatively easily and dramatically substitute away from this product. Any change, any increase in the price would drive demand uh, to zero. So in this case, as supply gets shifted up by the legal incidence of the tax, all the bargaining power rests in the consumer's hand and the incidence of the tax falls entirely on the uh, producer. So the um, legal incidence uh, and the economic incidence of the tax in this case are the same. So it's the relative elasticities of the demand and supply that matter in understanding who ultimately pays the tax. Uh, let me just briefly introduce question five of the assignment. You weren't required to do it, and I appreciate the fact of, that some of you struggled, uh, uh, well, more than struggled, did quite a good job in some cases. Um, um, but I want to give you some tools uh, to help you um, review that question, take another crack at it if you already looked at it. Here's the question. Um, it talks about manipulating perfectly competitive markets to reach some quote-unquote desirable or, uh, if you will, uh, fair price. Three different programs, quotas, a price support program, and deficiency payments. Let me just define, let me just define these programs in terms of the tools we have and then leave you to answer um, the questions in each scenario. Um, do comparative static analysis to understand what the price is, how much the consumers purchased, did it go up or down, the incomes of the suppliers, and then the cost to the government. And then finally, once you've done all of that for each three program, do an assessment of the programs. Uh, which would you, as an economist, recommend to the supply side community, to the demand side community, and to a social planner interested in the well-being of all citizens? So here is what quotas are. They are, in some sense, a limit on supply, an enforceable limit on the amount each supplier can sell. So it's as if we took the supply curve and made it perfectly inelastic at a given quantity and a quantity associated off of the demand curve with a price that we desire. No more than this amount will appear on the market. At this price, suppliers would like to supply this amount. So you can see once this quota is in place, there might be an incentive to try to cheat and get extra supply in the market. So begin here and do a comparative static analysis of price, quantity, and producer uh, uh, incomes as the question asks. A price support program is um, a government-induced demand. Uh, demand sufficient to support the particular price. So in a perfectly competitive market, we end up at P star, Q star. The, gov the government can't just decree a higher price. It somehow has to engage in this market. And if it's interested in supporting price P, then it creates a demand equivalent to that price. When price is P, the amount of supply coming onto the market is Q. The government purchases this amount in order to take that off of the market, leaving consumers with only Q, little Q, which sells at this price. So there's a government-induced demand, and the government is purchasing this much of the, um, of the commodity. It says to producers, go ahead and produce as if price was P, and we will soak up any excess supply that would have otherwise bid the price down to maintain price at P. 
Now there's a question of what the government is going to do with its stock of goods and the expectations market participants have of what it's going to do to the stock of its goods. We can discuss that next day. So price supports are government uh, purchases to support a particular price. Finally, a deficiency payment is a government subsidy. The government says to producers, go ahead and produce as if the price was big P. And if that was the case, they would put on the market Q. Go ahead and produce that and put it on the market. But the consumers aren't willing to pay price big P for quantity big Q. They will only pay price little p. Their willingness is to pay is read off of the demand curve. So the government says, go ahead and produce as if price was big P. Put it all on the market and sell it for what you can get. That price, if they wanted to, if they if they sold it all to consumers, would have to be P. There is a shortfall between big P and little P, and the government pays producers a subsidy equivalent to that difference in price. Okay. That's a deficiency payment. So again, assess these three programs, quotas, supports, and deficiency payments in terms of price, quantity, uh, uh, incomes, and costs to government. All right. um, I'll leave that to you. And if you could submit your answers just to question five of the assignment um, by uh, 4.30, next Monday, I'd be very grateful. Um, and submit, I mean, send them to me by email, of course. So to conclude, let's just handle a few administrative issues. Next day, we'll complete our discussion of um, influencing price in perfectly competitive markets by uh, reviewing your answers to question five, and possibly, if there's time, to talk about other markets like the price of oil. But the main objective of that class next Tuesday is going to be to talk about market failures and government intervention. And so I, I want to um, uh, key you to a couple of words as you do your reading. Externalities, public goods, try to understand what those are and what the public sector response is in that case. Okay, I'll remind you to um, uh, about the uh, course requirements. Again, it pays probably now to reread the uh, course outline. Um, there's going to be another take home assignment, call it a test if you like, and I'm going to distribute that by email um, next Tuesday, and the due date is April 21st. After next Tuesday, we, we go on break. Um, when I send you the email, I'd certainly appreciate a confirmation that you've received. Uh, the assignment. And finally, um, those of you choosing to undertake a book review, um, please let me know which book, I know, and I know some of you have uh, done this, please let me know which book uh, you uh, choose, probably uh, sooner rather than later, but certainly at the latest by April 21st. If I don't hear from you by April 21st, I'm assuming you're not going to use that option. Um, and by the way, I just wanted to add another book to the list of possible books list um, that are offered in the uh, course outline. Uh, an interesting book I read recently by Anne Case and Angus Deaton called Deaths of Despair. And I thought that might be of interest to you. So if you're going to pursue this option, uh, put this book also on the list of possibilities. Um, with that, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm certainly interested in your feedback, and as our online experience uh, continues, um, we'll incrementally try to improve it, and if you, have, if you have any suggestions on how to improve it, I'd appreciate hearing those. I have some ideas, and I'll, I'll float those by you uh, next day. Until then, um, sincerely everybody, take care of yourselves, take care of the people you care about and love, and I look forward uh, to seeing you or interacting with you again next week.